Hello, and welcome to week, week eight of ESTEP as a prelude to our investigation of Minnesota's geological history. What we're going to do this week is investigate geologic time. So with that, I want to go to the slides and bear with me here. Okay, so what we're going to look at today, oops, is, um, as I've mentioned, geologic time. So there's quite a few topics when we're investigating geologic time. So I'm going to start by just looking at how we think about time, and then I'm going to go through some of the um, fundamental principles and laws associated with geologic time, look at how we construct the geologic time scale, talk about the principle of cross-cutting relations, and then go through how we interpret geologic history from a cross-section. In a separate recording, I'm going to go over radiometric dating or absolute age. So on the right is a very simplified but colorful and I think very accessible um, conceptualization of geologic time with all the various time chunks um, identified. So let's dive into this. So there are two ways we think about geologic time, absolute age and relative age. So absolute age is another word for a number that we give to um, the age of a rock or how old it is. And depending on how old that rock or maybe sediment is, that'll be in thousands, millions, or billions of years old. So do remember that now is zero and we count back. And the way we get these absolute ages is through a process called radiometric dating. And this involves isotopic decay of certain elements. So if we're getting absolute age, what we want to know is are the minerals in the rock that contain elements that undergo radioactive decay? And that, if there are, that means we can extract them from the rock to get an absolute age. On the other hand, relative age is something that's much easier to do. What that is telling us is, um, if we've got a geologic unit, and I'll use that for a uh, layer of sedimentary rocks, or maybe an igneous intrusion. And relative age is about when it was formed or was disrupted relative to all the other units in the region. And we determine the relative age by investigating the geologic relations in the region. So what we're really asking when we're investigating relative age is, is this rock or unit younger than rock X or strata X, or is it older than rock X or strata X? And we use this knowledge to build up the geologic story for a region. So as we move through this, um, this diagram here is just a reminder that a cross section, in other words, a vertical slice through the earth is just that. And we portray geologic relations on cross sections and we use cross sections 
to tell the geologic story. So here in this cross section, we have the land surface where my cursor is moving right now. And then we go into a valley and then we go up on the other side of the valley. And everything below that is the geology beneath the land surface. So if you've worked with cross sections and geologic time before, you might want to see if you can um, figure out what's happening here. If you haven't, don't worry, we're moving on. So there are some fundamental principles or laws, and we start by looking at them. They're based on sedimentary rocks. And these principles or laws are called Steno's laws. And the first one, let me just go back a moment. Okay, I jumped through things. All right, so the first one, whoa. All right, so the first one is called the principle of superposition. So this just says, or it's a fancy way of saying, that if we've got an undeformed sequence of sedimentary rocks, like the one diagrammed at the top right, the oldest layer is at the bottom and the youngest layer is at the top. What I usually do with students is I just deal out some cards that I've already um, picked. So there might be a nice sequence that could be a winning sequence in various card games. Um, and they can clearly see what's on the bottom was the first card dealt and they get younger as you go up. Same principle here. Oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top. And this is how Nicholas Stino wrote this in, get this, 1669. This was a long time ago. And if we then go into the field on the bottom right, we can see a whole sequence of layered sedimentary rocks. And we know that the oldest will be at the bottom and the youngest is at the top. These are undeformed sediments. If we start moving into deformed sequences where rocks have been folded and maybe overturned, then you want to have to check sedimentary structures to make sure that yes, indeed, the oldest is at the bottom and the youngest is at the top. But in simple sedimentary sequences, the Oldest is always at the bottom and the youngest at the top. And that's called the principle of superposition. So the next of Steno's laws is the principle of lateral continuity. And this just says that sedimentary rocks are originally deposited as flat, continuous sheets. They extend laterally until the layers get thinner and thinner this means that layers don't suddenly stop unless something has happened to them. So here we are. There is nowhere that this is better demonstrated than in the Grand Canyon. What you can see here is sedimentary layers. Now, the reason it stops, so to speak, right here is because this layer actually once continued across the canyon to match up with what's on the other side. But the whole Grand Canyon has been carved down through this sequence. So here we have continuous flat sheets. And we also happen to know that the reason that they stop right here is that the canyon was carved down into them. But we can match up the layers in this pale part of the sequence with the layers in the pale part of the sequence we can see over on the north rim of the canyon. And the third key law is the principle of our original horizontality. So what this says is in sedimentary rocks, the layers were formed as horizontal flat layers. 
If they are not flat, something has happened to them. So this is reasonably logical. If we look up at the top, we have flat horizontal layers. But if we now shift our focus down to the bottom, oh my goodness, these layers are not horizontal. They are not flat. In fact, you can clearly see that they have been folded. Note the Jeep down here for scale. So it, this is just a simple way of thinking about what has happened to sedimentary layers. And we can start using this information to decipher geologic histories. So bearing that in mind, what I want to do, I'm just going to go back and check I haven't missed anything. OK, um, so is to just think about how geologists have constructed the geologic time scale. I showed you a simplistic diagram of the geologic time scale in the very first slide. And how did geologists put together the time scale? So if we think about it like this, um, long before we had the capability to get absolute ages or do absolute dating, people were investigating the layers of sediment. And in various places around the world, they found several different sequences. And you can see those represented by these stacks of different colored, colored units here. And what they were able to do was effectively piece all that information together. If you look here, you can see the greens once you get to um, Central Europe, you can see the greens are overlain by the oranges. But once you get into um, the Asian continent um, or Eurasia, um, you can see that those oranges are then overlain by a brown and so on. So this, if we just use this color coding, you can see that what happened was people were correlating sequences to build our overall geologic time scale. Now, um, don't panic when you see this. This is the official geologic time scale. It's actually, I think it might have um, now be version 5.0, but we've got 4.0 here. Um, why are there different versions? Well, we still have all the same main names, but our knowledge of the absolute ages marking the boundaries of these different units um, change as we refine our knowledge. So how do we actually read this? So all the verbiage we see here are names for the different time chunks. And so First of all, let's just look at how it's organized. So we read this series of columns like Western newspaper columns. The youngest is up here, right here where I've got my cursor is zero. And it gets older as it goes down. We re go back to the net top of the next column, go down. We're getting older and older back up here and we go down here and then we go here and down. So what are all the different names used for geologic time? So we have eons, eras, periods, epochs, and ages. Eons are the really big time chunks. Um, and these include Archean, Proterozoic and Phanerozoic. So on this time scale, we have Archean here. And do note that the scale on these columns isn't the same in each column. That's to make sure everything fits in. Archean is the oldest eon. Then 
is the Proterozoic, which is younger than Archean from about um, 2,500 or 2,600 um, million years ago. Once, and all that gets generally lumped into a chunk that is called Precambrian. Now, um, so after the Proterozoic, everything more recent than the Proterozoic or the end of the Precambrian, and it isn't written here, is called Phanerozoic. So that includes the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. So Phanerozoic is an eon, and it is divided into three main eras, Paleozoic, old life, Mesozoic, middle life, and Cenozoic is young life. And that's because before we had a way of getting absolute ages, geologists knew that the fossils in the rocks were telling us about um, where we were in evolutionary history. They thought of them in terms of uh, the life that existed then. So um, once we are uh, um, looking at any one of these eras, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, or Cenozoic, that is then divided into these periods. So in the Cenozoic, we have two main periods, the Neogene and the Paleogene. Way up here, we also have the Quaternary, which is divided into the Pleistocene and the Holocene. That's when most of the sediments that were deposited across the surface of Minnesota were deposited. So um, don't worry about all the terminology in here. The only really important um, phrases to understand the use of is you'll see the terms early, middle, or late being used. Early means older. So if we're talking about early Jurassic, that means um, the older part of the Jurassic. Late Jurassic means the youngest part of the Jurassic. And then if we have middle, it's in the middle. Um, that can be a confusing piece of terminology. Now, just getting back to how that uh, geologic time scale was initially constructed. Um, it had to be produced through this correlation process because we don't have a complete record of um, sedimentation everywhere in the world. There are times when sediments aren't being deposited in one place but are being deposited in another. And you can think of this in the context of the rock, rock cycle. Think back to the rock cycle when you've got uplift happening, that's when um, sediment is being eroded. It's taken away from one place and being deposited in another. So let's take a look here. Um, sometimes no sediment is being deposited. Sometimes sediments get eroded. And sometimes, as I just alluded to, the rocks underneath the sediments are being tilted um, before sediments are deposited. So what we know is, um, or there's a very important concept here, layers of sedimentary rock that were deposited without any interruption get called conformable. That means you just got one layer on top of another, on top of another with zero interruption. On the other hand, if there is a period of time during which deposition ceased or erosion removed previously existing material, a feature we call an unconformity is produced. And essentially, it is a surface 
that represents a time period for which there is no rock record. So the really important thing I want you to remember here is that time is never missing. It's just that time isn't represented there because material was being eroded. So I'm going to just uh, switch to the document camera here. Bear with me a moment. And I'm going to draw some examples of these unconformities. So, I don't like that color. All right. And there are three main types of unconformity. Let's see, I need to just focus that a bit better. There, that's better. So I'm going to draw some three simple cross sections. Remember, this is a vertical slice through the earth. And there we are. And so you can imagine there's your house. And there you are walking along. So house, well, you may be a bit smaller than that, but this works to just remind you. Now, um, unconformities are typically, but not always represented by a curvy line. Um, why is that blue? Um, okay. Um, so, just bear that in mind. This isn't always the case. But so what we're going to do here is I'm going to label this U for unconformity. And the first type of unconformity is a non-conformity. And in a non-conformity, we have either igneous rock or metamorphic rock as the basement rock. Igneous or metamorphic beneath sedimentary rock. So what happens here is I'm drawing some nice tidy layers of sedimentary Rock here, I've got a sandstone with dots, a shale with some dashes, and then another sandstone up here near the land surface. So what happened here was that, well, I'll draw a little boundary between the igneous and the metamorphic rocks. Um, they are our basement. We talked about basement last week, and they got that basement rock was uplifted. That means that there was an erosion surface carved on it. And then there were sediments deposited on that. But that whole time period of the uplift and erosion of these rocks is represented by this unconformity. So that's a non-conformity. The second type of unconformity is called an angular unconformity. Oh, I'm going to run out of room. Angular unconformity. And an angular unconformity is when the sedimentary layers beneath are tilted relative to the overlying layers. So in this case, I'm going to draw some layers here that have been folded. So here is our unconformity there. 
And I'm going to just add some symbols for the different rock types, dots for sand, little circles for a conglomerate, some dashes for shales. Then I'm going to put another sand, sandstone in, maybe another shale and another sandstone. And then above that, we have some good, nice horizontal layers with a conglomerate and a sandstone and a shale at the top. So the story here is it's called an angular unconformity because the rock layers beneath it are um, sedimentary layers, but they're at an angle to the layers above. And what that means is that the layers down here have been folded prior to the layers above having been deposited. So the unconformity right here represents the time period um, between when these sedimentary layers formed and when they were folded. And then there was a whole bunch of erosion that um, planed that area down. And then there was deposition. So that's an angular unconformity. And then the third type is a disconformity. And these are kind of tricky because here we have the unconformity. And in a disconformity, the sedimentary layers beneath, and I'm just, oh, I'm doing this box work pattern. This is a typical pattern used for limestones. And then I'm going to do the dashes for a shale. And then I'm going to put sands above and a shale up here, and then some more sand because it's easy to do dots. All right. So our uh, disconformity is this squiggly line. In reality, it's just a horizontal surface. And a disconformity is when, well, there's two options for it. Um, it either means that there was no deposition for a period of time. So we had this shale being deposited. Then for some reason, no sediments were deposited. And then we continued having sediments deposited and the sediments above are parallel to the layers down below. Or it could be some erosion, but there is um, no irregular surface. We just have anything, anything that was removed was just uniformly stripped out. And we just have... Um, a time period with no sediment representing that time period. So nonconformity, angular conformity, and disconformity. So now we're going to go back to the slides and okay. So we've looked at disconformity, oh, sorry, unconformities. And we looked at three types of unconformity. And um, let's take a look at them um, in real life. So remember the definition, a nonconformity. In this case, we've got metamorphic rocks underneath this, where I'm moving my cursor, is the actual nonconformity between the metamorphic rocks and these beautiful horizontally layered sedimentary rocks. And you can see they are continuous and horizontal. Then here is an angular unconformity. So in the foreground, you can see some layers of sedimentary rock, but they have been tilted 
they're sort of angled down towards the right, but they're tilted. These are layers of sediments or sedimentary rock. As we move our eyes up here, what I want you to notice is that we've got, in this case, horizontal layers of sand and gravel. And you can see there's kind of this irregular surface that has been carved onto this sequence of tilted layers. This surface here is an angular unconformity. It represents that time during which everything was eroded or removed. And a disconformity. Now, as I've mentioned before, I believe, um, disconformities are very hard to identify. So here, down below this line here or this contact between older sedimentary unit or strata and younger sedimentary unit, um, there is actually a whole bunch of um, time that is not represented by rock right here. And these can be hard to identify if one doesn't have fossil evidence, any clear reason for um, there being anything other than a just continuous sedimentation. So bear that in mind. Okay, so unconformities are useful for understanding geologic histories, but there are a whole bunch of rules and observations that we use to determine relative age. And these get called the principle or principles of cross-cutting relations. Um, you can also think of this as the multiple other ways we determine relative age, and it gets kind of complicated. So the definition that probably won't make any sense to you unless you sit back and sort of relax your brain is the unit that is disrupted is older than the cause of disruption. So right now, um, we'll get back to this in a moment, but the, uh, the main uh, groupings of cross-cutting relations that we need to consider if we're going to interpret a geologic cross-section and develop the geologic story based on a cross-section are uh, faults, intrusions. So that means igneous rocks that have intruded into other sequences. So if you have a body of granite, remember we talked about batholiths, um, the Sierra Nevada batholith, for example, um, intrusions, and then the rocks around them that get heated up and metamorphosed. They are, can be an important part of the geologic, figuring out the geologic history. If sedimentary layers have been tilted, if they've been folded, and then there's inclusions, we'll talk about that, and unconformities are part of this sequence of um, ways we go about figuring out relative age. Now, well, I'm not actually going to go to the document camera right now, but what I do want to point out is geologists use the words before and after. And so if we, if you hear so someone saying um, X happened before Y, it means X is older than Y. If you hear someone saying C happened before D, it means C is older than D. If someone uses the word after, it means, okay, um, if someone says F happened after R, it means 
that R is older and F is younger. So using the terms before and after it correctly is important. All right, let's look at these. So first of all, thoughts. So in this image, I want you to use the distinct coloration of the layers to identify some faults in this image. And a fault is just a planar break in the rock. So I'm moving my cursor along one of the faults and then another one right here, where there isn't quite as much displacement. So we can see sedimentary layers and if we focus on the fault that I'm moving my cursor along right now, we know that movement on the fault took place after deposition of the sediments and their lithification. So we've got information on the relative age here based on the sedimentary layers that are displaced along the fault. Next up is intrusions um, and metamorphic aureoles. So first of all, um, let's just look at this image here. This is um, in or from an area in Greece, if I've got this right. And so what I want you to notice is these dark lines that are going up towards the top. And you can just see it sort of going up there. This one sort of snakes around a bit, goes kind of squiggly. These are actually basalt. They are basalt dikes. And they are cutting through these layers and they're actually feeding some of the basalt flows that we see up near the top. This one, you can see it coming. Um, it probably feeds this uppermost layer and it sort of comes down, does something funny in here. It looks as though it splits up in two. But what we know here is that these dikes, not the granite, don't, that's a mistake. Um, these basalt dikes are younger than the white layer and the other lower layers because they cut across that layer. Sometimes one can see evidence in the basalt for what we call chilled margins. So I'm going to go to the document camera and do a sketch here. So bear with me. So um, what I'm talking about here, we've got a couple of cross sections and the land surface is just conveniently flat right here, there. Now, um, I'm first going to, in this case, draw a dike the salt dike cutting across some layers. And often the salts are shown by little V symbols. And I'm just going to make this a conglomerate. This is a sandstone and that's a shale. So we know that the basalt is younger than those sedimentary units. And I'll actually call these A, B, C, and I'm going to call the basalt K. So we can say the basalt um, intruded after deposition of C. Now, if we were to go and look right in here at the boundary of the basalt, what we might end up seeing is in the basalt right here, we might see something that's called a chilled margin, chilled margin. And what happens in this case is that when the basalt intrudes, whatever it intrudes, um, that other stuff is 
cold. And so the basalt right next to it cools much more quickly. And there is often a glassy area right in there. Sometimes it ends up being slightly darker looking or paler looking, but there's something different about the margin. That's called a chilled margin. That's a good way of double checking what you kind of already think about the relative age. Now, in the second example, I've got a granite here that, um, I'm showing it with pluses. And in this case, it intruded a sedimentary sequence. So what you need, need to have a heads up here. If you're looking at a cross section and you see granite down at the bottom, there are two options. Either it is younger than the sedimentary sequence or it may be basement. How do you tell the difference? I'm just going to add a few other little symbols in here. I'm going to make it a sequence of sand and conglomerate because that's easy. OK, so the fact that it cuts across those other layers suggests that it might be younger. But what's really important is that all around that granite will be what we call a metamorphic aureole, or it's contact metamorphism. So what happened here was we had a nice tidy sedimentary sequence. I'm going to call it L M N and O, that's the letters, letters that I'm identifying those layers with. They were just sitting there. Then a granite came in. I'm going to call it R. And adjacent to it, all those sedimentary layers were metamorphosed. And we call that a metamorphic aureole. So that helps us know that R is younger. Now, the way I've drawn it here, the metamorphic aureole doesn't actually extend up into O, this unit. Um, so it's possible that we could say that the metamorphic or the granite intruded after N but before O. It's also possible that that was just too far for the heating to make a difference to the rocks. And in fact, R is younger than or happened after O. So that's um, some simple cross sections and intrusions and metamorphic aureoles. We're going back to the slides now and let's consider, all right, so here we are, and this is actually in the Canadian Rockies, here is a view. We've got some igneous rocks here. This is a granite, it happens to be Jurassic in age. And if you went and walked or climbed up here, what you would see is that there is an area in between the nice, tidy Cambrian limestones and this Jurassic Pluton, granitic Pluton, where the Cambrian limestones have all been metamorphosed. The use of the term calc silicates is that tells people who know that are uh, these rocks have been metamorphosed. It's not, um, it should really say metamorphic aureole right in here. Um, so this is an example where we have older sediments, sorry, sedimentary rocks that have been intruded by a granite. And here we have a metamorphic aureole. So 
What's important to remember is if we changed this into a thrust section, just because the granites low down, remember that doesn't mean it's the oldest. You have to look for other pieces of information that will help you identify. The alternative would be if it if there wasn't a metamorphic aureole, there would have to be some kind of unconformity here between the granite and the sedimentary rocks above. Okay, um, tilting, also loosely called deformation. And so here, once again, we've got some beautiful tilted rocks. And all we can say if we're considering this view is, okay, these beds or strata have been tilted since or after they were deposited and lithified. Sometimes things get really confusing because there can be several tilting events. So next up comes folding. So typically, um, or not typically, um, if one can see in the field that rocks have been folded. And so here we've actually got, we call it the nose or the hinge of a fold in the two images on the left. But if we look here on the right, we've actually got a angular unconformity here. So the unconformity is right here. The layers down below were folded prior to the development of this unconformity. And then above, even though it's kind of subtle, you can sort of sense there's some kind of layering in the rock up above this unconformity. Next up comes what we call um, inclusions. So the big deal here is we're in igneous rocks here. And what I want you to notice is that there are blocks of other rock, this one here, this large one that I'm outlining now, and then two more up near the top that have been included within the, the background igneous rock. I'll just call it a granite. Um, so what this is telling us is that these other blocks existed before the granite was there. And effectively, as the granite came up from down below, it ripped these blocks off from somewhere around the magma chamber and they basically hitched a ride in the granite as it started to move up. We call these inclusions. And so we know that they represent rock that formed prior to the granite. So we've got one, two, three types of inclusion here. So we might go and look elsewhere nearby and see if we can find whether the rocks that we see as inclusions are actually present anywhere else. And that would help us tie together the geologic history. So um, I wouldn't call these inclusions, but here's another example of how we can um, use the idea of materials being reworked. So here we're looking at a sedimentary rock and it's what we've got are lots of large cobbles and boulders. In this case, they're cobbles and boulders of mostly limestone, but that's telling us that this conglomerate, remember conglomerates, um, was derived from sedimentary rock. And these blocks were just being eroded, moved along, and then deposited. And so that can be useful for helping us put together our geologic history. So um, 
We've already looked at unconformities. Just remember that these can be used as part of telling our geologic history. So let's look at some simple cross sections now. So there are a couple of general rules. One always wants to list the units that um, are represented. And often when we draw diagrams, we will put letters on them. If we're tying things to a map, we'll use the same symbology that's used on a map. But when we talk about the order, we always put the oldest first, because what we're doing is we're saying we're gradually building our history, going from oldest to youngest. So ultimately, I've got a list here. The list starts with the oldest and goes to the youngest. Um, the thing to remember is that on this perfectly flat land surface, the current land surface is or well, the creation of that flat surface is the most recent event. I haven't included that here, but if there's some shape on it, you always want to say carving of the recent land surface. Now, um, so generally I start working from the bottom. And now, so I'm looking here and even though it isn't, I'm going, okay, I've got some layers, Q, N, and R, and it would make sense that Q is the oldest, N, and then R because of the principle of superposition. But then I've got M, which is a granite represented by these crosses or pluses. And even though I haven't told you this, there is a metamorphic aureole that um, is around the granite. So that means we know it's younger. So the granite isn't the youngest. So we know it goes Q, N, R. Um, now, we've also got this dike. Um, and I'm just going to tell you it's a basalt Dyke. This isn't the standard um, symbology used for a dike, but it's what I'm using right here. We know that L has to be younger than R and younger than N because it cuts a through N or a cross N. It disrupts N. Now, um, the there are supposed to be dots um, that are going across L. It doesn't show very well here. There's supposed to be a metamorphic aureole or metamorphism impacting that dike. That tells us that M is the youngest event. Okay, so we have Q, N, R, L, and M. So. That's um, the order of events. Now, um, here's another one. Now, we now need to think about what happens in between the formation of these layers. Because in this case, this line here that disrupts the layering is a fault. And so we have to start talking about not just the units and their age, but the events that happen related to things like a fault here and, oh my goodness, here's a wiggly line, we've got an unconformity. So in this scenario, the sequence is A was deposited, Z, then B, they were um, sedimentary layers. Then there was faulting that disrupted them. The block on the right moved up relative to the block on the left. Then there was a period of erosion represented by the unconformity. And 
that was probably associated with, you know, uplift on this fault, but we don't know for certain. And then finally, unit X was deposited. Here's another one. So I've got the um, sequence here. I suggest you pause the video and look through it. And there's a couple here where I suggest you pause the video, see if you can figure it out. And then here is the answer in the upper right. Another one. Okay. So with that, we're going to stop the first part of our geologic time lecture, and then you're going to come back and I'll talk about absolute age. See you soon.